the ultimate climate smart crop. Nitrogen fixing pongamia trees produce more biomass per acre than soybeans with a fraction of the inputs. But introducing any new crop to the food or biofuel supply chain is not for the faint hearted, says Taviva. So the pongamia tree is like a lot of frontline indigenous community trees. It grows really well in difficult soil conditions. What makes pongamia very exciting is that it's a legume producing tree. So you can imagine soybeans growing on a tree. The challenge we had to overcome with pongamia is that while you can get high yields of these beans on poor quality soils, the yields are inconsistent. And while the beans can be used for certain niche applications, the beans are also very bitter. And so it doesn't make it suitable for all the applications that you would see soybeans used for. So things like feed ingredients and food ingredients. So Terviva has worked very hard on both of these challenges over the last decade plus. Uh, we have built a, an extensive crop breeding platform around Pongamia where we're now able to get reproducible and consistent high yields of these beans on tier two agriculture land. And we've developed food processing to debitter the beans and make highly usable feed ingredients and food ingredients from the oils and the proteins that are in Pongamia. So our edible oil, which we call Panova oil, has entered the market. Uh, we're doing small scale sales. We're doing sort of almost like test and learn types of sales with leading brands where we can talk about the story of Terviva and Pongamia with the oil. So a great example of this is with the brand Aloha. They're a Hawaii origin brand. They're telling great things about regenerative agriculture in Hawaii. We've been able to bring our Panova oil into their very delicious bars that are themed around Hawaii ingredients. And we're able to work with them to tell the story of our trees growing up on the north shore of the island of Oahu and how we've had an impact on the farming community and the land uh, around that particular area of Hawaii. We'll continue to do these types of small volume applications over the next couple of years. And then in 2026, we expect to bring the first larger scale point of sales into the U.S. market. We are building out the manufacturing operations for that today. We're building out the sales relationships for that today. And right alongside of that, we're not forgetting those other markets that we want to tackle that soybean addresses as well. So while we're building the food ingredient sales, we're going after very low carbon intensity biofuel feedstock sales. And we're also selling feed ingredients, protein feed ingredients in the India market. So uh, Mitsubishi, one of the world's largest corporations and very diversified. They have a energy business. They have a food ingredients business. They have a feed ingredients business. They're partnered up or own some of the largest players in food, agriculture, and energy around the world. And so what's amazing about this relationship is that it's coming straight out of a mandate to decarbonize. And obviously, like one of the most in-demand sectors for decarbonization is sustainable aviation fuel. Pongamia will work for that market. But to make a very profitable business, you'll also need to sell other things. So Mitsubishi's truly helping us across every aspect of our business. They're helping us sell biofuel feedstock, they're helping us make and sell feed ingredients, they're helping us make and sell food ingredients, and I think very importantly and very uniquely to a company like Mitsubishi, who for example owns a piece of, of Olam, as an example, they're also helping us scale tree planting. So the Pongamia bean is roughly one-third oil and two-thirds protein carbohydrate. And so we've perfected that extra bit of processing that's needed to fully de-oil that protein meal but also remove all of those extra bitter compounds. At that point, you have something that can go into animal feed at a very high inclusion rate, yes. or ideally into human applications, right, where you've got a highly functional, roughly 35, 40% protein ingredient as a flour. Yes. And then of course you can do all the magic that they do with protein ingredients by concentrating the protein, getting into a concentrate or an isolate, yes. where you have you know sort of similar types of functionality that are therefore enhanced. So. Things have cooled off a little bit, as you know, Elaine, in this whole space. Yeah. We're being very selective in how we bring the protein ingredient to market. Very easy for us to baseline our sales with animal feed. Nice thing to do. And we're now finding those ways to bring it into the market as a, either a, a human flour or a human concentrated protein ingredient. It has been, in the last 12 months, it's been really hard to form capital to bring new food ingredients to market. So we've had to rethink the scalability of that whole part of our business. We've made a couple decisions. The first is that we've, we've walked back some of our assumptions on scaling up the oils and the proteins as food ingredients. We're still bringing it to market on the timeline we expected, but at a lower scale point. We're gonna divert our bean volume more so toward biofuel and feed. We can generate a positive gross margin there. It's not a very high gross margin compared to food ingredients, but it's still a positive gross margin. 
And then the third component is we're, we're going to form a manufacturing partnership for these food ingredients. We have a partner in mind. We'll hopefully be announcing it in the next three or four months. Somebody who can take the risk of manufacturing this off of us and give confidence to the market that they will be able to scale these ingredients at, at volume and at a good quality. There are so many challenges to building a company like this. Terviva has been around for 14 years. If I'm going to reflect on the most sort of recent downturn in the market, I think what's interesting for ag tech, for food tech, is that the development cycles of our technologies are longer than the economic cycles in which we operate. And so, for example, for Terviva, things were getting nice and hot on novel food ingredients, let's say 2019. COVID happened, slowed things down a little bit, but then things picked back up because everybody was interested in novel food ingredients. But then boom, you know, two years later, this market downturn hits. And for most of us that were developing novel food ingredients, that just wasn't enough time to actually bring everything forward into the market. So fortunate for Terviva, we have other products that we can pivot to. We can do biofuel feed stock, we can do feed ingredients. But I think the real challenge is you gotta be able to last through cycles. You gotta be able to have partners who believe in you, who will pull you through those difficult cycles. And if you can't make it through the cycle the way that you thought, you, you actually have to bring down the investment you spend in the business. Yeah. So again, in our case, we didn't have to fold Terviva. We just had to take our food ingredients business, look at it very carefully and say, hmm, we might have to deprioritize investment here and move investment to another product set that mattered more. So that pivoting, even for a small company, is, can be painful. I would say in this market moment in ag tech where everybody's trying to form capital, corporates, strategics have never been more important. Yeah. Uh, appreciably, the financial capital has paused or that's taking a slower look at what's happening. Strategics, most strategics are operating on some kind of a mandate to decarbonize, to improve their sustainability footprint, and they are taking a longer and patient view toward it. So uh, I think it's a great time to partner with, with strategics. There's some caveats to that. I think you have to be careful about not giving away too much when you do those kinds of partnerships. Most strategics want a lot of upside yes. for their capital in terms of product availability or technology licensing. Yes. But I think if you have a, you know, if, if you're careful, if you talk to multiple strategics and try to find the best one that fits your business, you can find a really great partner who will contribute capital and who will give the rest of the capital markets confidence in your business.